Um, a good evening and welcome to all our attendees today. Um, I'm Tanishka Kachru. I am part of the archives team and uh, really pleased uh, that you've all joined us today uh, for this event, which hopefully is the first of many events that we are going to have over the next one year uh, and more, of course. Um, and I'm, I'm really pleased because over the past one year, we've been, uh, the team has been working intensively uh, to improve public access to NID archives. And uh, the ways in which we are doing this is by working on launching our digital collections soon to come. We're still we're just a few months away from doing that. And um, secondly, the public programs, uh, a series of research talks, uh, which I'm really pleased we're launching today. Uh, and this has, of course, become even more urgent in the current times that we're in when um, we're not able to attend uh, you know, events uh, in person or even have physical access to the archives for visitors. Uh, so, uh, I'm also very pleased that today we have our director Praveen Nahar with us here. Hi, Praveen, uh, to help us launch the Archives Public Program 2021-22. A uh, few words from you, Praveen. Yeah, uh, can you all hear me? Okay. So, uh, sorry, I'm on the on the move in the in the train, and uh, I'll just be very brief. And uh, happy to see you all uh, and thank uh, all of you for uh, you know the NID archives uh, public event uh, is getting launched today. And as Sarishka said that we are trying to see how much uh, we can work around the archives and you know make it accessible. And we are hoping that this year we'll have a we'll have a lot of open access and uh, all kinds of you know uh, attempts are or the efforts are going on to do that. Uh, Anisha and her team and our archives team is uh, looking at that and we are looking at all the design histories of India and the global networks of uh, uh, modernist art and design like uh, EAP experiments can be shared and you know, revisited or you know, worked around it. Uh, with respect to uh, uh, with respect to uh, the EAT uh, experiments in arts and technology, I think there are many artists who have come to NID at the time when its uh, experimental pedagogy was uh, in development. Uh, today, uh, as we transition into future where hybrid and physical, physical digital models of learning and communicating are seeming essential, the spirit of experimentation is what we must inform developments in uh, you know, it must inform development in design pedagogy. I think there is a lot to learn from what was experimented and what we can do today. I hope that we can draw lessons from revisiting uh, historical moments uh, like EIT at NID and really look forward to this launch and you know, uh, conversations today. I don't know how much I'll be able to follow based on the signal, but uh, definitely I'll go to the videos and welcome everyone, uh, our own graduate uh, Ranjit and Christine. And I'm sure that you are going to do a formal introduction to them. And uh, really pleased that we are able to kick off uh, this today. Thank you, Tanishka. Over to you. Thanks, Ravi. Um, I, uh, so, uh, with, without much delay, I'd like to hand it over to uh, Suwani Suri. Uh, who and Shreyasi uh, Patak, who are the curators and assemblers of this series. Uh, but I'd just like to say quickly that Sirwani is um, an amazing person who I've been having conversations with EAT about, you know, for I think three years now. Uh, but I think finally we've come to a point where, you know, those conversations have moved to the archive and, the, you know, beyond uh, just uh, what we were. Um, sort of imagining back then. And it's funny that it's actually happened in pandemic times finally, uh, but maybe not so. Um, so uh, yeah, Suwani is joining us from Delhi and uh, she works with sound and intermedia. Um, and she has of course been teaching in NID for a while, full-time for a while and you know part-time 
uh, now nowadays I think um, and uh, uh, it's uh, it's been a really pleasure to work with her so over to you Suvani and to our wonderful speakers thanks thank you so much uh, Tanishka and Praveen um, can you hear me all right yeah so hello everyone uh, a huge welcome to the first session of the series um, over the last couple of months, it's actually been a real delight to uh, develop our conversations and formulate this program. Um, as someone who is deeply interested in sonic archives and also the tentacular histories of the dialogue between emerging technologies and artistic practice, this chapter was actually a very fascinating and uh, compelling one for me to also enter into and reopen collectively with Tanishka, Shriyasi, and all of our panelists. So uh, I'll just give you a brief overview of EAT and then we'll uh, move on with the session. Um, so EAT or Experiments in Art and Technology was an organized collective of artists, engineers and scientists founded by Billy Kluver, Robert Whitman, Robert Rauschenberg, and Fred Waldhauer in 1966 to forge a space of creative exchange between experimental art practices and technological innovation. Um, in the period from late 1960s to early 70s, various seat initiatives were undertaken, as a part of which several artists visited India for extended periods of time to study, teach, perform, and work on collaborative inquiries. As a part of this process, NID and the Bad happened to be one of the many sites which hosted the artists and engineers and witnessed and participated in some of these interdisciplinary transfers and encounters that took the shape of workshops, public performances, exhibitions, and pedagogical frameworks. Some of the participants included uh, John Cage, David Tudor, Lowell Cross, Jared Bach, Trisha Brown, uh, Yvonne Rayner, Terry Riley, and many more. Um, the inaugural series of the archives public programs tunes into the spirit of the EAT happenings in India as an attempt to reread the chapter from our contemporary location. So in each session, we'll be inviting artists and scholars who've been investigating the archives from various perspectives and share their work, concerns, and critical reflections. Through the sessions, we hope to engage with a range of crucial questions that we've been uh, marinating in uh, over, the, over time. Uh, questions that are to do with institutional archives, collective infrastructures, technological access, artistic desires, pursuits, and motivations against the ideological background of that milieu, as well as the politics of cultural exchange. We are full of gratitude towards all of the speakers and panelists who've actually taken time to contribute to our sessions. And um, uh, goes without saying as well as to each one of you who's joining today. So as we proceed with the session, please feel free to participate and uh, type out your questions in the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, you can also um, just unmute, uh, raise your hand and we'll unmute you and we, can, we could get your questions right after the sessions. Um, without further delays, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today, Ranjit Menon and Kristen Holmes, who are both joining us from Finland. Ranjit is an artist and designer from Bombay, currently based in Helsinki, with a transdisciplinary background in experimental sound design, interaction design, and systems thinking. Ranjit has been actively exploring and enabling creative reuse and open access to cultural heritage through several projects. As a digital fabrication specialist, he's interested in establishing a strong link between the arts and emerging technologies through research. He's also been an active designer for internet advocacy and knowledge democratization movements, such as Open Knowledge International, the My Data Movement, and a core member of Hack for Open Glam chapter, for the upcoming Creative Commons Summit 2021. He's currently partnering with the collective Tactical Technology in Berlin for co-designing campaigns against misinformation and fake news in India. Christian Ekholm is a Helsinki-based designer who works with sound in the field of performing arts. He's been working for over 15 years within the broader field of performance, ranging from theater to dance to installations and music. He's been a guest lecturer at Metropolia Polytechnic Theatre Academy of Finland and NID in Ahmedabad. So I'm really excited to now turn the floor over to Ranjit and Kristen. And a huge thank you for kicking off this lecture series. We are very happy to have you. So over to you, Ranjit. Thank you so much, all of you. Um, 
And uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really big privilege uh, to be able to talk about TAT archives as we last found it in 2018. And uh, I, I believe today there are people actually from the original EAT present for this talk, which is, uh, uh, which is quite dreamlike to think about. And yeah, I would also love to welcome Christian uh, again, that he was able to make it uh, for this session as well. Christian, if you want to say hi or something, feel free. Oh, thank you. Uh, good to see you all. I hope you can hear me. Um, it's a privilege. And I thank him very much for this privilege. And uh, I mean, now we're going to jump uh, into the year of 2018 and have a look at, uh, well, uh, a discovery of, of the EAT. Uh, from our perspective, uh, um, the journey kind of starts a few, few years back. And we had uh, something of a chance encounter, which provided turned out to be really, really, really fruitful and, and, and really fascinating. Um, so I want to thank you for this uh, opportunity to uh, discuss our, our, our experiences. Right. Uh, I suppose you can hear me? Yes. Yeah, you can. Okay, cool. All right. So um, uh, there is a lot of slides. So I'm going to be skimming through a lot of them at a high speed because I realize or we realize that today there is a diverse audience. There is people who are not acquainted with what EAT is all about. And if we jump in directly into our archive discoveries in NID, I think that would be uh, too much of a shortcut for some people. So I'm just going to give you as brief of an overview as possible of this very in interesting and important uh, uh, organization that uh, we as designers, artists, or anybody uh, in the public should be more aware of. Um, so um, I'll just go through some of the aspects I'll, we'll be discussing. One is the background of EAT, of course, and the timeline of EAT extending from the original movement till, uh, till the current times and also personal timeline uh, where I encountered these archives while I was uh, studying at NID uh, back in 2005. And our course, which is called Experiments in Art of Systems Thinking, how that came into being, which is basically what me and Christian was teaching in 2018. And uh, we will have discussions either in the middle of this or perhaps uh, it's better to have it like after the end of the presentation. And then I would like to reconnect some of the uh, things that we did after we came back with these findings. So um, I'll jump right into the uh, core of what Experiments in Art and Technology um, uh, is. It's, uh, it's, it's an organization that was uh, in the United States, uh, I think mainly in the New York area, they were facilitating um, contacts between artists and engineers to work together. And in order to answers, uh, in order to arrive at answers to societal challenges and questions dealing with technology and the kind of changes that happen with technology. And Experiments in Art and Technology was founded in 1966 by the engineers Billy Clover and Fred Baldhauer and the artists Robert Rauschenberg and Robert Wickman. And um, this organization developed from the experience of um, a very significant event called the Nine Evenings. But even before the Nine Evenings, uh, there is a bit more history to uh, this sort of uh, attempt at blending art with, uh, with technology. So the seeds of VAT, um, is definitely uh, the vision of Billy Kluwer, who was an engineer at Bell Labs. And um, he, um, sorry, I missed this one slide. So Billy Kluwer was uh, the visionary behind the EAT. And uh, as a Swedish engineer with Bell Labs, he had a passion for art film and the social impact of, of technology. Here you can see that he is uh, he's with, uh, with a gas discharge neon letter for a certain painting. So he as an engineer was helping the artists to push the technology, uh, to demand the technology needed to pull off uh, whatever was required for the art. And uh, uh, according to the research that I have done, uh, the seeds of this movement could be seen uh, in the form of Billy Clover's first installation with an artist, which is uh, a self-destructing installation. It has a unique timing and triggering device it releases smokes and starts a fire and it makes noises and it destroys itself in 27 minutes. So this was the uh, Billy Kluwer's first collaboration with an artist 
um, in a, I believe it was in a gallery. And then uh, Billy went on to, um, uh, Billy was, I think in his uh, spare time was uh, always visiting New York from the Bell Labs headquarters uh, to uh, make friends with the local artists. And he, um, he has worked with many artists before EAT became an organization. And in this example, there is Ivan Reiner, who was one of the, uh, who is one of the participants of the soon to become nine evenings event. And uh, here he has been uh, helping her to, um, uh, to, to, you know, to an extension of her body as a dancer, to be able to communicate her movements and other uh, body movements uh, through radio transmitters and contact microphones. And she's also one of the artists that would later on uh, be visiting an ID and India as well as one of the nine American artists uh, in India. This brings us to nine evenings. So after Billy Clover uh, was able to work successfully uh, with some of the artists, um, there was more momentum to build something bigger or grander. So then happened the nine evenings and the nine evenings were basically 10 contemporary artists of the time uh, in the US working together with uh, 40 engineers. I've also read 30 engineers, but basically it was pairing one artist with one engineer and then a team of engineers to uh, pull off uh, uh, for, for the more resources needed to, to handle the technical aspects. And the outcome of nine evenings, uh, this is what actually led to the creation of experiments in art and technology as a, as a nonprofit organization, as a concentrated effort to promote collaborations between artists uh, engineers and scientists. And uh, within the nine evenings uh, event, uh, which had very big PR at the time in 1966, uh, I would just go to some of the examples to give you a overview of uh, how much ahead in time they were in experimenting with technology and the arts. So for example, Robert Rosenberg who was one of the artists commissioned for the nine evenings. Um, he had a uh, he had a performance called the Open Score, in which there was, uh, you know, there was two people playing tennis with these rackets, uh, which had a contact microphone, and it was sending wirelessly the the, the signal to uh, to uh, uh, amplifier setup, and it was also changing the sound and the lights. I believe there were 48 lights on when the match was on, and then with each stroke, with each hit of the ball, one of the lights would go off until it was pitch dark. And once it was pitch dark, the audience would uh, would uh, turn into the performers. So the, the, the infrared cameras would then turn into the, turn to the audience, and they would see themselves on the big screen. So that was uh, that was his performance, and that was how the engineers helped him pull off this technology, and transmitter on tennis rackets and so on. And at that time, it was uh, uh, wireless transmission of audio and lights and so on. They were like really hard to come by or almost non-existent and no market products existed for, for these kind of things. And then you have John Cage who is, uh, you know, well known in the world of experimental music uh, in serial compositions and also in, uh, especially in, actually the title of our presentation, Chance Operation, it, it, it sort of is a play of John Cage's philosophy and approach to music making, uh, which is uh, chance music or opening up the probabilities and permutations for improvisation to happen in the music so that it's not, it's not strictly linear. And um, in his performance, uh, the engineers or one of the core uh, engineers behind the EAT movement designed what looks like a pretty modern device that, you know, this could, this could be seen as the, uh, the first module of its kind, which was used to control sound and lights. And uh, it was being controlled with a pen light system. So this was made for David Tudor and for John Cage uh, to use for one of the nine evenings as one of the nine evenings performers. And you can also see around uh, some of the other uh, gadgets that were uh, enabled for them by the engineers. And uh, John Cage being John Cage, he also had 10 uh, open telephone lines uh, during the performance to various places in New York City and uh, basically um, the sounds coming in from these open lines were picked up by the receivers and they were fed to a sound manipulation system. And in addition, those were triggering further some uh, radio bands and television bands. And there was photocells that were also being controlled 
through the amplified signals to control the lights. So uh, like a performance system through technology. So these are all way ahead of its time, or you could say like nothing like this had ever been um, performed before uh, for a wider public. So the key thing about nine evenings was it was open to the wider public and yeah, there was a huge amount of people who uh, came to see this because it was a massive, massive auditorium. And then you have the first example uh, of another of the performers, Alex Hay in the nine evenings, uh, where his brain waves, muscle activity and eye movements are picked up and transmitted wirelessly uh, through speakers, uh, through a very miniature mobile unit. And uh, these, the size of these mobile units are so small that even today it's hard to find mobile un units that would, that would actually do so much um, integrated. Uh, for performance. And then there was uh, solo dance performances where there were radio control carts and the act of controlling the motion of these radio carts were done uh, by, uh, by a conductor, a uh, team of performers as if they're conducting an orchestra. And then you had some of the first examples of film projections uh, from vehicles on big screens. And again, a lot of contact mics and uh, audio uh, triggers from, from some performers and on some objects and so on. Um, so yeah, 1966, it's all way ahead of their time. And also building these massive structures uh, by Steve Paxton. This was the passage to, I believe the nine evenings or this was one of the props or one of the, uh, one of the performances where the, uh, where there is a, this is what would be called nowadays like a participatory performance where the spectators or the audience are also contributing to the narrative. So the, so the performers had like, uh, I think magnetic pickups, which were again, triggering some of the audio and interacting with the sound and the lights. And Steve Paxton would also be one of the nine um, American artists who would travel to India in 1970 to 71. So I'm just uh, sort of setting the base for what EAT was all about and where we are going to end up in uh, many years later. After the success of the nine evenings, uh, immediately there was a big interest from the artists and from the engineers to start to work on more projects like these together. So the EAT became a formal organization. It be became a nonprofit formal organization trying to enable this to happen. And they had a meeting uh, bringing in artists and engineers together and uh, they had a pairing system where they had these, um, I believe they are, they are kind of these obsolete, um, they're these obsolete uh, sort of punch cards. I forgot what they're called. Um, they are uh, edge notch cards. And basically they had, uh, it had like, you don't even see these things now, but basically in order to pair an engineer with an artist, the engineer would sort of like, uh, 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 mark out uh, which of these, uh, uh, which of the areas of expertise uh, they would be able to contribute to. So if they're good in computers, if they have, to, as an engineer, if they're good at contributing in material science or sound or media, or even soft, sk uh, soft skills, then they could uh, mark those. And then the artists would, uh, for example, artists would need somebody good in sound or good in computers, and they would then be paired with that engineer. So there was this really interesting pairing system, which you don't really see even today in like interdisciplinary contexts and so on. So it was a very, uh, very well designed pairing system, I would say, and uh, and also a system where the artist, the demands for the artist was respected, and uh, the uh, the vision of the artist was given total integrity, and they could realize whatever they would really try to realize whatever they were imagining. So there are more fantastic examples from nine evenings. Uh, I won't go too far into that. But this also brings us to 1970, after EAT became a formal organization, this would be uh, the most, uh, the highlight of their, um, uh, of their movement. Um, according to uh, the anthology called Pavilion, which uh, Julie Martin and Billy Kluver um, published, uh, the, the Pavilion is not an object, it's a unique experience. And the group effort leading to the Pavilion is analogous to community projects of pre-industrial societies. Its aesthetic impact is secondary. So the pavilion was uh, basically a combination of commercial interest, uh, artistic interest and science blending together perfectly. 
and it was built it was funded by pepsi cola in those days uh, you know in the, the expos are typically associated with very dry commercial uh, you know happenings and this time pepsi uh, from where i read maybe because it was in japan they demanded a more artistic way of representing uh, the expo so the ad artists were invited to to uh, to to use to use their skills and imagination and know how to the fullest and by now uh, they already had experience of doing so many uh, so many interesting projects which i haven't mentioned by the way like there's a lot of uh, very very interesting collaboration projects that they have done and uh, uh, and this particular this was the golden team of the main eat that was working with the pepsi uh, pavilion uh, you can see uh, david david tudor on the left with uh, i think this whole uh, this whole um, the organizing principle for this uh, pepsi pavilion was uh, based on sound and based on the idea of immersive theater um, i uh, billy clover had this idea that uh, an expo should be a live performance all the time so that no matter where you go there is an element of drama or theater versus uh, like just a dead place or a cold place where things are fixed so everything was dynamic uh, very cybernetic in nature and you can see on the right the the inside of the dome was completely made of a spherical mirror so that the participants could basically see uh, themselves at any possible angle and of course these pictures are not going to give you even a, even uh, uh, the closest uh, of uh, experience Uh, but i believe there are better videos perhaps online uh but uh, this would be uh, this was this was one of the uh, best uh, uh best things that eat pulled off through these uh, associations of artists and engineering um uh, which brings us to this particular era of eat around this time um, the late Uh, 60s to the uh, early 70s which has relevance to india also so in the 70s there was a lot of changes in hardware technology uh, transistors were becoming perhaps more mainstream um, there was more data processing uh, better better uh, more mini more smaller ways of uh, operating computers and system software systems so uh, this also pushed the artists ambitions and requirements and uh, i think this is where the pavilion also is situated uh, this also brings us to the next set of uh, things relevant to india so this is uh, this this is one um, one of the ad experiments where nid amdavad was actually involved in 1971 um, it was uh, to telex machines they had connected four cities across the world so there was tokyo Sony headquarters, then Ahmedabad, and uh, I think it was mainly run from Modern Amusement in Stockholm, and then Automation House in uh, New York City, and uh, they had connected these four places to um, to explore this uh, to to explore the scenario of what the world would look like in 1981, which is 10 years from then on, and uh, each each place would then respond with their cultural, social. and political uh, environment that they are in in how they see the future 10 years from now and uh, this is beautiful it's very poetic and even now uh, i haven't really seen that many examples where there is four or five cities or places connected in such a poetic fashion talking about the future and so on uh, so this is this is one of the examples that uh, happen around the time of the internet launch and uh, there were projects eat did outside art uh, which was um outside art meaning that it's uh, it's not so much of subjective shoe gazing but more of like real world problem solving so they were dealing with issues uh, problem solving issues with the human beings and the environment uh issues with education food distribution which brought the eat to india because at the time uh, uh at the time vikram sarabhai was running the space program i'll come to that in the next slide uh so one of these uh, project they did outside art was to introduce uh, introduce the essence of internet to random uh, to kids in two different neighborhoods in new york by setting up uh, telex machines telewriters fax machines through 14 telephone lines and 
uh, basically the kids could sketch something and it could be like sent to some other random kid and they could set up a communication randomly with each other. And this would be the first taste of internet for kids for sure. Uh, because at that time it was only being developed for defense or military and these kind of closed corporate uh, places and so on. So uh, EAT brought this uh, uh, brought this out to the kids, and then um, this is the example of a satellite project that Vikram Sarabhai was interested to uh, to to at the time and being um, being uh, being part of the Sarabhai family. I think he had. Uh, either connections to EAT or to, through through some other networks, uh, he had connection to the artists from the EAT, and they were invited over to uh, experiment with educational and learning programs using the satellite for rural education. And this resulted in this Anand project uh, executed by EAT in 1971, which was basically instructional software of first of its kind. And uh, it's also exceptional that uh, we talk about instructional design as something that happened after new media, but this was an example of instructional design uh, and very much human-centered instructional design where proper, proper visual video-based ethnography was done with the uh, diary farmers. And it was a participatory process. So definitely an, a good example of design, uh, design as well. And then uh, to make a point about, uh, there's an overlap between experiments in art and design and the artists who are also coming to India outside that context, um, uh, not just as part of EAT, but also as individual artists. Uh, Ford Foundation was, I think, uh, bringing them to India for a year or less <clears throat> in, order to, um, uh, in order to exchange ideas and build relationships with, uh, with Indian culture heritage and also with design schools like NID, for example. And here I have highlighted some of the names that uh, were also present during the EAT days. Uh, Nine Evenings, Steve Paxton, Ivan Reiner, uh, they were all in Ahmedabad as well. And some of them were also in NID. Uh, this is just an excerpt of one of the artists who was interviewed later and she was talking about, uh, you know, that, uh, her contemporary dance was perceived as exercise. So a lot of interesting insights by the artists once they went back. And, uh, but even before that, in already in 1960s, through uh, the Sarabhai family, they had an art residency for a lot of artists like John Cage, David Tudor, Merce Cunningham, especially with John Cage, uh, uh, already at the turn of 1960, he was uh, influenced by the Indian uh, concept of aesthetics of rasas. That led to uh, that that led to his uh, philosophical change in how we perceive music, and he came up with uh, a different way of playing piano based on these nine archetypal emotions. And David Tudor, who is also uh, one of the most famous experimental musicians, touring with John Cage. Um, he had also been uh, very much uh, making artworks in India as well. There will be a talk by Yu Nakai, who is uh, definitely an expert in David Tudor's works, uh, who will be speaking, I think, um, a, a few weeks from now. But one of the laser performances he did, I believe, in NID, uh, or Ahmedabad at least, uh, attracted a huge amount of people, and later on it was performed in uh, 1979 at one of the big uh, discotheques in New York called Zenon. Then Merce Cunningham was also in India in the 1960s. Uh, uh, basically all of them came as a one group, uh, as, uh, as a dance group, John Cage and Tudor. And uh, going back to again, the nine evenings, Robert Rauschenberg who did these tennis rackets uh, with, the, with the sensors, uh, he was making, um, uh, a different kind of artworks in Ahmedabad with local materials. So yeah, there is a footprint of American artists that overlap with EAT. And uh, this brings us now to the NID. Um, now, when I say NID at this context, it's it's kind of like overlapping with the time when the Sarabai family was actually patronized, was the, the patrons of NID and they had a lot of artistics. Uh, there were a lot of artists coming in from the US as, as I just showed. And, 
uh, many of these artists also ended up teaching at the NID various kinds of interesting courses. And that's sort of gives an overview of how the EAT might have. Now we have to like also remember that we have Julie Martin here, who is like the director of uh, EAT here. So hopefully after my presentation ends, we can get some more insight on this phase. And uh, at the National Institute of Design, uh, apart from the uh, big names in design, there was also Billy Kluwer, who uh, was guiding uh, was guiding the Pepsi Pavilion at the time. And uh, Kluwer proposed that NID and EAT sort of join forces in a far ranging collaboration. And uh, this uh, brought in some of the first hardware equipments and uh, you know te technical themes and also perhaps the first electronic music uh, equipment such as the MOOC synthesizer. By default, this turned NID into the first electronic music studio in India. And uh, there's a lot more uh, deeper aspects to that. And now we jump back to my personal experience with these archives. Uh, none of this was, uh, I was not aware of any of this history when I was studying in NID at all. Uh, basically going back to 2005, there was a convocation where we were made to work for, uh, um, we, were made, we were made to work for one, uh, um, for the convocation ceremony. And the idea was to get some of these tapes pools uh, digitize them and they had some sort of bird sounds and the idea was to ha hang speakers from from the foundation tree of NID uh, as a sort of like an installation art uh, but when we did that then the birds started like going crazy um, so we basically had headphones instead of speakers uh, but it, it made me curious enough to visit the library and check why bird sounds like who would make bird sounds just like that and then I was looking through the catalogs and I saw names like John Cage, Tudor and so on. So it was in my head that time that there, there is something that is, is perhaps like uh, should be known more. But then I was also into music and sound a lot more. Uh, and then, uh, in, uh, then I went on to study sound in new media, which gave me a, a historical timeline of what Cage and Tudor did and India was part of it. And then I was, uh, I was, I remember asking people around if they knew that they, they were actually in India making music, but nobody's, uh, even the professors didn't seem to know that. So I was like, okay, maybe nobody really knows that they were making stuff there. <laughs> and then uh, meeting Ranjan, discussing about the EAT and the MOOC and so on. So basically um, this is the foundation tree I was talking about where I heard the bird songs. And then meeting Ranjan again in 2014, uh, we discussed a lot about uh, those years. And I remember him talking about like laser uh, performances um, and some sort of like color performances so using like lights happening happening uh, with David Tudor and so on. And I was uh, curious, like, well, where can I find more information about this? But he just said it's all lost somewhere and there's random things uh, found here and there. And, and then this, uh, this article is what triggered me and Christian actually to, to think about uh, what we would do in Ahmedabad. So uh, this brilliant article, it, it, it basically talks about these MOOC synthesizers, which were auctioned off for a few rupees, I think, for to one of the former faculties. And uh, the fact that it was in Ahmedabad uh, and it was one of the first handmade since made by MOOC himself, that made us curious. So it was basically this synth that kind of drove us like, wow, these synths, can we get to see them or see the history and also see, and I had this vague memory of John Cage, David Tudor's uh, loops, tape loops somewhere. So that is kind of like what drove us like this curiosity to come and explore further. And at that time, um, Praveen had come, who is the current director of NID by the way, he had visited uh, Finland and he had met me and uh, I was interested in systems thinking as a, as a course and as a, as a certain discipline. And he asked if I could come and take a workshop in, uh, in 2018, January, um, a two week workshop uh, or a course for the product design students. And uh, anyway, I was scheduled to travel in 2018. So when I saw this article, I think towards the end of 2017, I just picked up the phone and spoke to Christian. Uh, would you like to come along and teach this course? Because we can sort of combine systems thinking with 
uh, with uh, experiments in arts and technology because it's the only subject where we can actually combine stuff like this. <laughs> if we teach anything else, you can't really think of VAT in those terms. So we were like, yeah, let's let's try to expand the pedagogy and experiment with the pedagogy a little bit. Uh, so that explains why and uh, why we made this 20 teaching trip. And also, well, I don't know if Christian wants to add something here, he can. Uh, but basically, the why also extends to a lot of things we have done together. So whenever there is any weird project, especially an art performance or even like we were, uh, we, we have done a lot of things together. So it was just like, this sounds crazy enough to jump into like with you. <laughs> so that was one reason, right? Yes, more or less. <clears throat> I think we could go to the uh, uh, slides of the uh, course content and just yeah. uh, skim them through quickly. I thought that yeah. I might want to add just something here. I mean, uh, we, we, we studied with Ranjit together in, in, in uh, our classmates at the uh, design school here in Helsinki. And uh, yeah, we didn't, we've done a bunch of projects and also the hard stuff here. And uh, Ranjit made, gave, gave me a phone call and asked me, how about a systems course in, in, in the NID? And I thought, that, what, what, what are you talking about systems course? And then he kind of dumped the EAT thing on top of it. And we're just like, what is this stuff? Uh, I mean, theater and engineering is basically what I've been doing for 15 years and now. Um, and for some reason, that's the tagline of, of, of the nine innings. For some reason, the specific nine innings and the EAT had not we, uh, we've never discussed it here, and I never stumbled upon it in, here in Helsinki. Uh, it was a new thing for me. Super interesting, though. So we kind of had to cobble something together in, in, in order to actually go on location to NID and, and start to figure out what this EAT thing would be. And, and we kind of came up with this specific, yeah, kind of a th three nodes within a pyramid that kind of is, that would be the content and, and the framework of, of what we would do with this two week module. Uh, with the design students in the NID. And, and, and that being said, the three nodes were kind of loose and, and, and had many interpretations. But roughly, we had like a node which was creativity and, and creating an art. Uh, um, in this, here is written as hands on design process. Uh, then we got the node of systems thinking, which was kind of bigger framework, how we ended up with the specific course module. Um, but that we obviously expanded to systems art and all sorts of, well, still the framework of having the bigger idea of systems. Uh, to, to guide the uh, uh, creative process that the course would uh, consist of. Uh, that being said, we had like a, a, a course that was basically in two parts. The first part being uh, uh, four days of, of, of uh, or the first week being an intensive kind of deep diving groundwork of, of, of what we'd be doing. And then having a, a, a second work of, of like a creative, so a second week of creative process with an, uh, a demonstration or, or an installation or a, a kind of issue of the process that we did. Now the creativity node and, and the systems thinking node were two of the nodes and the third node would have been obviously the EAT, which we somehow made into ES, e, EAST, which was kind of our um, um, translation of, 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 of uh, EAT. We kind of just took, took that specific idea and, and updated it into 2018 and just wanted to run our, our own experiments. Uh, through this specific node, and that being said, the uh, EAT the third node would, would, was also defined through locality, specifically through history, which was one of the, um, I mean, the students, we were working with the students, we had assignments of them trying to figure out this EAT thing, which was very new for them as well, and gave us the opportunity to uh, do some, well, research and, 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 and Try to figure out like on location what we could find and what we could see and what we could work with. So like uh, yeah, three three nodes that kind of led us to a a, a road of 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 creative arts and technologies, uh, which ended up with the workshop that kind of uh, solidified in 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 this case in, uh, in uh, well installation. We tried to make the well, in systems arts, you have often the process more in focus than the actual end result of the art piece or the artifact of, of, of the process. But in this case, I would say that the end result of the specific um, process was at least equally kind of cool yeah, and, as, as the, the actual process. The end result. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah, let's go. Um, 
Yeah, so so this was like a course overview. We had color coded these three uh, areas. One yeah. one color code was if we find anything from the EAT archives, then that would be used as content. So that's like a, yes. a blank slate for now. And then we had like a color coding for the systems thinking theories, and then one color coding for the for the design process. Various themes that we introduced during the course. Uh, it's too uh, maybe a bit too cumbersome to run through them individually for now. So I'm going to fly through these. But we basically introduced the idea of in transdisciplinarity by picking up examples from uh, experiments in art and technology. Christian brought in examples from, for example, uh, his work as an artist in Helsinki in performance and installation art as a sound designer for experimental theater and so on, uh, which definitely overlapped with processes um, used uh, by EAT as well. And it's undeniable that as artists, when you work with such installations and such themes, uh, in systems thinking is part of your process. It's implicit. It's all about if you want to make it explicit, how you do, how would you do that? So the exercise was that get something hands on done and then try and see where systems thinking lies. And then we gave them the vocabulary to understand and the literature to understand systems thinking better. So this was how we pulled off uh, most of the first four days. And then on the fourth day, uh, we were like, okay, now we have to, can we get some archive? Can we get content from EAT as part of our course? So the assignment we gave them on day four was to go and, uh, you know, go to the uh, library and go to, uh, go to some alumni from the past, from the EAT era, ask them, is there any way we can find some relics, some content we can use for installations for this? course. So um, they really surprised us, to say the least. <laughs> so this is a moment I've captured where Christian is completely surprised and shocked and happily shocked, I would say, at what, what the students found. Um, we basically hit a gold mine and we, you know, they brought us this pavilion book, uh, which was uh, not issued. When I checked the library dates, it wasn't issued since 1973 or four. So it, it was just there never really open. And then uh, there was some alumni who was talking about, who were talking about things like the three evenings, which seemed to us at the time that, that these are localized performances of the nine evenings, because these are people who were contemporaries of, of the times when uh, David Tudor was there teaching, John Cage was teaching and so on. And uh, pictures, uh, David Tudor's rainforest, um, uh, there was uh, nine evenings and also a couple of other shows in a, in a, in a beta max tape called shape for living and house warming. Don't know what's in there because I think these beta max, beta max tapes are still a mystery. Have they been digitized or not? Um, then special lectures and seminars from 1969. Uh, you can see John Cage was teaching in an ID, which is, uh, you know, quite a privilege. And then Robert Rosenberg was teaching pop art, uh, David Tudor was one of the sound teachers in, in NID also during this, uh, during this time. So basically that NID is kind of a bit different, right? From, from, from what was later on. An interesting mix of arts and design or the line is very thin between what is arts and what is design or arts, artistic research is informing design in this case, I would say. And the pedagogy had a lot of emphasis on systems and cybernetics, which was like, completely wiped out uh, in, the, in the later pedagogy of NID. And some other experts from random uh, history, histories of NID. Uh, I have contacted uh, Dadi Podonji, for example. He, he is probably has joined today as well. Uh, references to Soundscape, which was a light and sound display, which, uh, which, was, uh, which I believe is the one that Ranjan referred to, the performance by David Tudor, 20,000 people happened to be there. And then this is the best part. There was an abandoned warehouse uh, that we always passed by because, you know, nobody really knew what's in there. We were just like, it's just a building that's waiting to be demolished. But one of the students from the product design batch, um, he, uh, he just connected somebody saying something about the warehouse. And I remember Ranjan talking about some EAT artifacts hidden somewhere. So they actually broke into this warehouse and they just found all these experiments in art and technology hardware. And you have to remember that this hardware was made at the time, uh, ahead of its time with Bell Lab engineers 
there, there's probably things that were exclusively made for EAT. We don't know. Uh, but there was a lot of stuff that has been, hasn't been dusted since two decades or three decades. I don't know how long. Uh, but it looked like they were just labeled and they were just covered in heaps of dust. Um, I just asked Christian, like, does he think any of these, you know, would, would be, can be revived? And he just, he just shook his head, but definitely this was stuff uh, that was, uh, uh, I guess, an amplifier mixer there. Yeah. Yeah. Things that, yeah. You this part kind of hurts. I, I just a quick comment. This kind of hurts to see, or I have a kind of a, a strong feeling when when looking at these things. Since at the time when we were at that specific shack in that little warehouse, well, actually not that little. I mean, it was kind of unsizable considering everything. But but at the time we did guess that some of this stuff might have to do with uh, the EAT stuff. Uh, that happened uh, in, in the 60s and 70s at the NID. We didn't know how much, but it was kind of clear that some of the gear was older than the other, and, and, and some of the gear was really specific. They had really specific functions, and that they were that, that was gear that was uh, not anything like off the shelf that you would kind of use for, uh, in general, doing sound or light or whatever, but specific modules for specific functions that probably was, I mean, now in hindsight, that was absolutely, that was the uh, EAT stuff. Um, but that being said, at the time we were kind of thrown off. I mean, as you can see, those look like uh, this specific slide, I think those are IMAX or something like this. So there were some, uh, some gear that was kind of newer um, and we did not know, uh, I just lay, put all of these discoveries a little bit more into that this is in general, like old maybe analog gear that's not being used for the video or audio courses that used to be at the end of the or whatever. So the now when looking back, we should have been a, maybe just a tad bit more diligent with the uh, going through yeah. this specific part of our course. But I mean, that's hindsight is hindsight. Can't do much about that. Yeah, thanks. I think that's that's exactly the point that we uh, we left an ID. Uh, the time schedule was really tight, so. We left the warehouse the way it was because we thought, okay, no one's been opening it for 25 years. So maybe it's still there when we leave, you know, so we will deal with it later. So we just left it there and went back to the course. But we also found uh, there was some sort of digitization process ongoing. And uh, when I requested to see some of the, uh, some of the digitization things, uh, entries, then I saw, okay, there is a composition of David Tudor with one of the Sarabais. So there's a lot of things uh, that were being digitized at the time, but uh, it was mixed. You know, there was no EAT section or American artists mentioned. It was just mixed with everything else. And I don't know which of these got successfully digitized and which haven't been, but you can see here that there is David Tudor stuff here. So these things were just accidental chance encounters. You know, it would be like a John Cage performance. And then we had like a second week after discovery of all these, uh, that was uh, really, it felt like all of us were meant to be in this course <laughs> and it was meant to happen. So now there was a new momentum and what is called like, I guess, learning by abduction where you uh, you learn by reflection through, uh, through different processes, but then learning by abduction means you just take a leap of faith. So this is the installation, I wanna do this and I'm inspired by what I saw. So they really, really, after all these exposures, they really wanted to make, the students wanted to make uh, an art installation, uh, demonstrating um, some concept of systems thinking. And so they started experimenting, uh, making small prototypes of holograms. Um, and then uh, the hologram display was scaled up as a potential idea. And the, the, they chose a metaphor uh, from systems thinking. So nature or natural processes of nature being circular and being organic um, and, and cybernetic that was chosen as one of the metaphors. So different elements of nature would be the content of the hologram. And then after that, we just left it to them and they made these posters uh, that references to experiments in arts and technology as, as a nod to the past. And then a reference to our course experiments in the art of systems thinking and second in February was the uh, day of uh, of the presentation of the or the final installation. So the day this is day eight when they one day before, and this is the final presentation. There is actually a video that gives more justice to what they did. Uh, 
but uh, because we will lack time if i show that video i think we'll just put it i'll put it in the link later on and uh, then comes the reconnection when we went back to to finland i was having a workspace in the finnish broadcasting uh, corporation i was having i was basically playing around as an artist with virtual reality and at that time um, i remember speaking to some people from the archives department asking them what are the possibilities of of flying in some of those beta max tapes because 